Hello, this is Gary Glaub in Morrisville, North Carolina, and we are up to Job chapters 6 and 7 in our study, our fifth lesson, and this one's about righteousness. So let's do a, a quick review from last week. So last week, we saw the response, the first response by Eliphaz. We call him Eliphaz the Eloquent, and he laid into Job, and he peppered him with backhanded compliments, and then he hit him with a roundhouse punch. And basically that roundhouse punch, based on Eliphaz's logic, was that because only the guilty suffer, Job brought all this on himself. And because the amount of suffering that Job was enduring, that Job's sin must have been egregious. So basically that's what Eliphaz lays on his friend. And poor Job, you know, the hard, hardest part of this to me is that losing the, his 10 children. But in addition to that, you know, think about some people might focus on his financial ruin, that he went from being a wealthy man to having nothing. And and then his servants are gone, his livestock is gone. His wife piles on him by saying, you know, hey, what you should do is curse God and die. And then his best friends come for a visit, and Job's finally thinking there's a little bit of a reprieve here, that his friends that love him are there to support him, and instead they lay into him too. So Job is just reaching the bottom and the end, and you know, all he really has is God left. And he pretty much has trouble understanding that. His health is gone too. You know, this is just, it's its a hard, hard situation. And I can't really imagine him going through it. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And it's hard to even appreciate how Job could be of good cheer in the middle of this. Is it He'd have to be, God talked about him as the most righteous, but he'd have to be incredibly righteous to be relying on Jesus in the middle of all this. He's entirely alone. And I, I was just thinking of the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. That's really the only friend he has. But if Job's friends would have sang that to him right now, it probably, in the middle of his self-pity, it probably wouldn't have done any good at all anyway. All right? Job's response to Eliphaz is what we're going to cover today in these two chapters. So let's start with Job 6, verses 1 through 4 in the New American Standard Bible, and it says this, Then Job answered, Oh, that my grief were actually weighed and laid in the balances together with my calamity, for then it would be heavier than the sand of the seas. Therefore my words have been rash, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me. Their poison my spirits drink. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. So again, Job is grieving his whole life. Children, work, provision, wife, friends, health, all that is left is God. But he's focusing on what has been lost, not what he still has. I would do the same, but what he still has, he still has God. He still has God on his side in a big way. But think of a time when you've grieved even one of those things being lost in your life. You know, a child dying, losing your job, uh, losing a marriage, you know, just one of those things, you know, having some kind of great financial difficulty. And we have this tendency of letting that one item just completely send us into a spin of turmoil. And all those things happened in the same time for Job. So, we, we shouldn't focus on Job's failure in this because we would fail even bigger. But think about a life as who comes. He didn't help at all. In fact, he added a burden to Job, you know, with his words. He made this even more difficult for his friend. Job seems to be making an excuse here, right? So basically in these words, he's, you know, I'm going to paraphrase again. He says, hey, the reason my words have been so rash is because I'm carrying way too much right now. You know, it made me think of first year at the Air Force Academy. We had five responses to any question. That's all we were allowed. And anytime we were asked a why question, the only response we were allowed was, no excuse, sir. So it wouldn't matter if, why is your shoe untied? Or why did you run away from that tornado? There was never a reason. And we weren't to make excuses. I think excuses are you know ways that we're trying to cover ourselves but the the truth is especially when we're we're believers and God has already made all these promises to us and he's got he's got our lives in our in his hands 
is that there's really no reason to make an excuse, is that God's got us, right? He's going to forgive us when we sin. We ask for forgiveness. God covers us, but he's only going to give us good gifts. And that's what he's giving to Job here, but it's just hard to see. It's very difficult to see. In verse 4, Job makes his own inaccurate conclusion. Job believes he's suffering because of God's poisonous arrows. And we were in heaven in that first chapter when we saw the interchange between Satan and God that we know that God might have removed that hedge of protection and allowed Satan access to Job. But this suffering is not coming from God. It's coming from Satan. So let's go to our next verses. Job 6 Verses 5 through 13, once again, New American Standard Bible, it says this. Does the wild donkey bray over his grass, or does the ox low over his fodder? Can something tasteless be eaten without salt, or is there any taste in the white of an egg? My soul refuses to touch them. They are like loathsome food to me. Oh, that my request might come to pass, and that God would grant my longing. Would that God were willing to crush me that he would lose his hand and cut me off. But it is still my consolation, and I rejoice in unsparing pain, that I have not denied the words of the Holy One. What is my strength that I should wait? And what is my end that I should endure? Is my strength the strength of stones, or is my flesh bronze? Or is that my help is not within me, and that deliverance is driven from me? So basically, you know, think about Job's crying here. It makes me think of, you know, parenting comments of, I will give you something to cry about. It's like, it's interesting because if someone's crying, they don't need something to cry about. They have a reason already. And Job's tears are real here. Job's pain is real here. We don't need to pile on or add anything, even if we don't understand what his tears are about. Job's pain is real. We all have different pain thresholds, and that could be mental and it could be physical. But just to understand that just because we wouldn't have re reached our pain threshold in a certain situation doesn't mean that it's wrong for someone else to. All right, everyone is allowed to have their own pain. But he says here, even a wild donkey is gonna bray. And that wild donkey isn't gonna bray for no reason. You know, yesterday I was sitting there while I was doing work and outside my window, there was a little robin that was out of his nest, but he couldn't fly yet. And he's in a bush. And all day long, I was watching the mother bringing him food. And this little robin would cry out for food. And within a minute, the mother robin is feeding him. You know, just she's there to hear him. And I just think that, you know, even that baby robin's not crying for no reason. He's crying because he's hungry. And then there's a response, right? And in the same manner, when we cry out, God has a response. You know, God doesn't take our tears lightly, all right? I think that's really important, but God even gives us this encouragement. And Psalm 56, 8 says this, You have taken account of my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? God keeps track of our tears, right? They're special to him. They're... It's more than a memory, right? He, he, he feels our pain and knows our pain and wants to be with us to carry us through our pain. Job has reached the bottom here, right? The bottom can be comforting, right? If you think about it, is that if you're at the bottom, there's only one direction to move and that's up. But the problem is when you think you're on the bottom, but you're really not there yet, right? Something else happens. Another calamity happens when you've already thought that you've reached the bottom. And in Job's life, I don't think that another thing happens for Job that affects him in a great way until chapter 38. And it's when God speaks to him, but we'll wait for that. Job is so despondent that he wants to die. It's not clear if he wants God to crush him and take, out, take him out of this world or if he's actually considering suicide, right? But it made me think of my trip to Israel. And there's a place there called Masada. And if you haven't heard of it, then it's south of Jerusalem and it's basically a mountain plateau. And after the temple was destroyed in the year AD 70, the rebels had congregated on this mountain plateau and it wasn't easy to get up and it also wasn't easy to get down. But what happened was the uh, they came 
in the year 73 to 74, and the Romans began doing sieges on Masada. And when it when they could see, when the people up on top of this mountain could see that the Romans were going to actually get there, that their plan had worked, there were 960 rebels that the night before the Romans arrived on that last siege, 960 rebels committed suicide. And it was interesting because the docent at the presentation when I was on top of Masada looks at this as something spectacular that those Jews did, that they all together committed suicide, when I couldn't help but think that if instead of committing suicide, they trusted in God, they might have seen a miracle come, you know, similar to the parting of the Red Sea or something like that, if they'd only trusted in God. And that's the same thing with, with Job here, is that, you know, God can still perform miracles and still does perform miracles. And when we've reached the bottom, you know, look and see what God's going to do. Job is really discouraged that he's received no deliverance in the middle of this. Uh, Job 6.14 says this, For the despairing man there should be kindness from his friend, so that he does not forsake the fear of the Almighty. In this statement, there's no differentiation based on the cause of that despair. So we can put ourselves in predicaments, and even if we are the cause of all what we're going through, we still don't need friends to add to that burden. Kindness doesn't cost a penny. Time, time might take some, right? And, and Job's friends are, are giving that time, but they're just not giving him any kindness. And it makes me think of that phrase, there but for the grace of God go I is that before we stand on the outside and judge someone else, we should understand that we could be in that same situation very easily. It's like, there's none righteous, not one. We keep hearing that again and again because it's true, but we can't judge someone else and what they're walking through because we could be in that exact same situation, all right? Consider also that if we show someone unkindness and it causes them to turn away from God, that's on us, right? We need to be leading them to God, not turning them away from him. All right, then we see the next passage, Job 6, verses 15 through 23. In the New American Standard Bible, it says this, My brothers have acted deceitfully like a wadi, like the torrents of wadis which vanish, which are turbid because of ice, and into which the snow melts. When they become waterless, they are silent. When it is hot, they vanish from their place. The paths of their course wind along. They go up into nothing and perish. The caravans of Tema looked. The travelers of Sheba hoped for them. They were disappointed, for they had trusted. They came there and were confounded. Indeed, you have now become such. You see a terror and are afraid. Have I said, give me something or offer a bribe for me from your wealth or deliver me from the hand of the adversary or redeem me from the hand of the tyrants? So Job begins by talking about wadis. And if you're not familiar with a wadi, wadis are very common in the Middle East. And basically it's a valley. And in any torrential rain, that valley that just might just be dusty, dirty, nothing all of a sudden becomes a fast-flowing river in the flash flooding, all right? I remember going in Jordan to the Wadi Room, and we didn't see rain when we were there, but you could see this just dirt valley, and all of a sudden, when snow melted, you know, he refers to that in this, um, it could come down really fast, but then it dried up quickly as well those dry beds became rivers, and then the rivers became dry beds again. And water could be there and then just gone the next. They vanished quickly. When Job's friends arrived, he expected sympathy, but it dried up as quickly as that dried wadi. He, he correctly attributes, Job does, this to the fear of his friends. And if you think about it, think about King Midas. Everything he touched turned to gold. And instead, in Job's life, it's really the opposite of that. Everything he touches is just turning sour. So there's part of it where his friends might even be a little bit concerned that because they have close access to Job, that they're going to be affected negatively in the same manner. All right. 
Job reminded them that he had asked them for nothing. He didn't ask for them to visit. He didn't ask for financial help. He didn't ask for physical help or even their help in figuring out the reason for his suffering. Really, all he wanted from his friends was sympathy, to love them a little bit in the midst of this pain. And then we see that word redeem again. And again, we're going to save that for another lesson when in chapter 19 of Job, it, it becomes even more important, but it's a it's kind of a deep and important study, and I just don't want to even touch on it until then. All right, let's go to our next passage. This is Job 6, verses 24 to 30. Teach me, and I will be silent, and show me how I have erred. How painful are honest words, but what does your argument prove? Do you intend to reprove my words when the words of one in despair belong to the wind? You would even cast lots for the or orphans and barter over your friend. Now please look at me and see if I lie to your face. Desist now. Let there be no injustice. Even desist. My righteousness is yet in it. Is there injustice, injustice on my tongue? Cannot my palate discern calamities? Again, I'm going to go back and read verse 29 and 30 again because I think they're so important. Desist now. Let there be no injustice, even to desist, my righteousness is yet in it. Is there injustice on my tongue? Cannot my palate discern calamities? So basically at the beginning there, he's saying, do you want me to shut up? Well, then at least speak words that make sense, that apply to me in this situation, instead of your sweeping generalizations trying to prove that you know more than I know. He says, Basically, your words have hurt me. They've insulted me and piled more pain onto me, but have proved absolutely nothing, and you haven't listened to a word that I said. Another reminder of the damage that we can cause by speaking as if we have the knowledge of God. Right? We don't. God can see everything. We see this little teeny glimmer, this little glimpse into through a pinhole into what's going on. And we can make some guesses, but that's it. When applying God's words to the lives of others, we can have the best intentions and still fail miserably. Are we giving them our opinion or are we giving them a verse from the Bible and knowing that the word of God will never return void, we have a lot better chance of helping somebody when we're sharing a Bible verse that we feel like is pertinent to the situation. All right. All verses cannot be applied. Also remember that. So think about Job's wife saying, curse God and die. All right. That's not taking that out of context. Is it not going to be something we should be applying to anyone in the same way? Let's say we're quoting some verses here from the chapters from Eliphaz is that Eliphaz isn't speaking God's truth. So it's interspersed with some of its truth and some of it is his opinion that's actually fairly dangerous. So we can't take those like they actually are God's word speaking to us. So be careful with context when quoting the Bible. I think that's very important. All right, the end of chapter 6 is incredibly important, and it says this in verses 29 through 30. Talked about this already. Desist now. Let there be no injustice, even desist. My righteousness is yet in it. Is there injustice on my tongue? Cannot my palate discern calamities? To me, this is that place where Job strays off the path. Is that up to this time, he's been trusting in God's righteousness, and then he starts to speak of his own righteousness. And we know there is none righteous. No, not one. We, we do not have righteousness. All right. Apart from Jesus clothing us in his righteousness, if we try to stand on our own righteousness, we're just going to fall. That's it. So this is where Job starts to venture into that place of standing in his own self-righteousness. It's interesting because I really don't think that Job would have done this on his own. I think that Job is defending himself to his friends and their attack on him is actually causing him to head in a sinful direction, right? It, it becomes about ego a little bit, about me. 
and instead of focusing on God, all right? Self-righteousness is always a very dangerous step. And if you think about the fact that Jesus purchased us with his blood, what right do we have? You know, we really don't have any rights. He purchased our lives. He's the one that has those rights. We don't have the rights because of the purchase that he made with his precious blood. All right, I'm also thinking of Peter when he walked on the water. At the beginning, when he took those first steps, he was walking walking in the righteousness of Jesus. His eyes were focused on the Lord, but as soon as his eyes became focused on the world and on himself, it was his own self-righteousness, he sank. All right, and that's what self-righteousness does to us. It makes us sink. I'm thinking about many people right now who are standing on their own self-righteousness, right? And they're looting and they're rioting and they, they're thinking about their rights. And it's always going to be a failure. Job begins to question God's justice as chapter 7 begins. So Job 7 verses 1 through 6 says this, Is not man forced to labor on earth? And are not his days like the days of a hired man? as a slave who pants for the shade, and as a hired man who eagerly waits for his wages. So am I allotted months of vanity and nights of trouble are appointed me? When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? But the night continues, and I am continually tossing until dawn. My flesh is clothed with worms and a crust of dirt. My skin hardens and runs. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to an end without hope. Job's sleeplessness, right? It has more to do with his perspective than what we could even imagine, all right? Because think about it, the more we go without rest, the more we lose perspective, all right? It has more to do with his lack of trust here than anything else, I think. Job is struggling with that physical pain and the fact that he can't even get a moment's rest exacerbates it all. It made me think of a woman in labor pains. And let's say that that labor doesn't go the normal course of a labor, but instead lasted for two weeks, right? Do you think that that incredible pain that endured and went on and went on and went on, do you think that that woman would finally get to the point where she would just adjust to the immense pain and be able to ignore it? I don't think so. I think, in fact, it would just start to compound where that pain would just be be so great that she couldn't see any way out and she might lose hope in the middle of it. And that's what we kind of see with Job here. It brings him to a point of hopelessness. Job thinks his days are going to come to an end and without hope and without hope. Think about what our hope is. Our hope is our future with Jesus Christ, eternal, eternally that we're going to be with him. We have that hope of being with him for all of eternity. And all of a sudden, if we lose that hope, every aspect of our lives will take a major hit. We also can see in the, in the following section how Job thinks, thinks this is going to end. Job 7, 7 through 10 says this, Remember that my life is but breath. My eye will not again see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no longer. Your eyes will be on me, but I will not be. When a cloud vanishes, it is gone. So he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He will not return again to his house, nor will his place know him anymore. So Job here is seeing his impending death. That should tell us something. Job thinks that this illness, disease, whatever is happening is going to kill him. And we know that's not the case, but the only reason we know that's not the case is because in the first chapter of Job, when God removed the hedge of protection, God gave the stipulation that you can do anything you want, but you can't kill him. So we know Job's not going to die in this. It's like knowing the end of a movie before the end of the movie comes. We already know Job's not going to die. But it makes me think, how should a believer approach death? All right. Should we trust in God? Should we have fear? What's going to happen? And it really depends on faith and strength of belief. God has told us that death shall have no sting. And he's also told us, you know, through Paul, 
that it's going to be the change is going to be a change of location. It's a blink of an eye. We're going to go from absent from the body to present with the Lord. So on our last breath, we close our eyes and we wake, we open up those eyes and we're with him. It's going to be an instantaneous change of being with him. You know, Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's not going to it's not going to take a lot of time for that to happen, especially when we think that God is outside of time. It made me think of my mom when she was she had emphysema and she uh, she was on oxygen and was just in, in a lot of pain for a long time. And as death approached, she carried this fear, and it's kind of hard to understand and differentiate whether or not the fear was of the process of dying or what happens afterwards. You know, what happens afterwards, we have these promises as believers, but we still have trouble, you know, conceptualizing what that's going to look like. But I don't think many of us are afraid of that part of it. But there are many people that are actually afraid of the process of dying, of the pain of dying, right? But we also know that God's not going to forsake us in our most painful moments. He's there with us if we will just rely on him. All right, now let's finish chapter 7. And this is verses 11 through 21. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or the sea monster? that you should set a guard over me. If I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you frighten me with dreams and terrify me by visions so that my soul would choose suffocation, death rather than my pains. I waste away, I will not live forever. Leave me alone for my days are but a breath. What is man that you magnify him and that you are concerned about him, that you examine him every morning and try him with every moment? Will you never turn your gaze away from me, nor let me alone until I swallow my spittle? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target, so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust, and you will see me, but I will not be. All right, so in verse 16, God Job seems to be telling God to just leave him alone. Is it don't bother me anymore? So Job is silent no more. He starts to follow the path of his of his friends and begins to attribute all this suffering to God when it has nothing to do with God. It's Satan that's attacking him. Job feels like he has been tried by God. And I've talked about this before, but being tried or trial these words in the Bible we might think about them in the wrong way. So let's let's take this and use a different analogy. Let's say that there's a teacher in school that wants to try me. She wants to give me an exam to see how much of her teaching I've learned. All right, so I take the exam. She looks over it, grades it, has a better understanding of how much I picked up. Okay, so what's the difference there? Well, the teacher who was doing the teaching really didn't know how much I had grasped from that situation. Whereas the difference is with God, God knows everything. God doesn't need to put us into a test to see how we, we will respond. He already knows. He has absolutely 100% idea exactly what we're going to do in that situation. So in any trial that he puts us in, when he's trying us, there's actually two things that can happen. Number one is that we will see that the promises that God made to us, he will fulfill. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He'll only give us good gifts. In any situation he's going to put us in, he's going to let us see that he is going to come through in the way that he said he would come through. And in the same manner, we can also see what we've learned. So the trial is for our growth. It's for us to be able to look and see how well did I rely on God in the middle of that? Or did I turn from him? You know, Job did a little bit here. Job seemed to be losing that reliance on God that he was so known for that God bragged on him. You know, I think that that's an important way, but do you think that 
having endured this whole situation, would would Job endure it differently the next time? And and truly, that's what God's goal is in all of our lives, is that each situation that he places us in, he wants us to draw closer to him. And then the next time, we'll handle it better. We'll walk in faith, not by sight better. He wants us to keep growing, all right? That's kind of very important. Interestingly, Job addresses his sin here. And he talks about, why then do you not pardon my transgression? Well, obviously, if Job hadn't sinned, he wouldn't refer to his own transgression. Take away my iniquity. He knows that he sinned. But what he doesn't understand is, how was this sin so great that I'm enduring what I'm enduring? So he makes that same supposition that, Sin has some correlation with the suffering he's enduring when it does not, all right? Many aspects of life might not seem fair, even if we are questioning it, all right? Think about David in the Psalms, always talked about, you know, basically, why do the wicked prosper, all right? So I think there's that common thing in all of us where we wonder, is like, how does it appear to be that the wicked people are doing better than those that are following the Lord. But it, it's just not about this earth. It's about what comes after this earth. This is the ground, the testing ground, that we're going to get to that next place. And don't store up your treasures here. It's store up your treasures for heaven. But don't forget, it's not about us. It's about God. You know, if, if we belong to God here, he keeps us here even because it's about him, so that we can touch other people with his love. He can still love us while we're here, but we can use that love and affect other lives by loving others. And I think God wants to wrap his arms around this broken world, and I can't even think of a time in my lifetime when this was any more apparent than it is now, where there's a virus that affects the whole world, and then there's this racial inequality of people feeling feeling like they're not warranted they're not cared about in the same manner that other people are and and there's just this anger and resentment and it's gone into looting and violence but just so much anger i i don't think i've ever seen more anger than i see right now the political divide in this nation it's just crazy but it's this broken world surrounding us right now has god ever been needed more and the answer is no, I don't think that he has, not in my lifetime anyway. So next week, let's let's proceed with this and let's see when Bildad enters the fray. Another another friend to pile on. So once again, Gary Glaub in Morrisville, North Carolina. God bless you this week.
am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love and watch me rise again? And who am I that the voice that come to see would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am, cause I am yours. Whom shall I fear, whom shall I fear, cause I am yours. Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling Lord you catch me when I'm falling And you told me who I am Cause I am yours